All right, and for more on our election coverage, we turn this morning to political expert and editor of the LULAC Political Letter blog, David Yonkai. Hi, very Yay. happy to be here. Hey, good morning, David. Thank you for joining us all. We start with the governor's race this morning. Tom Wolf win over Tom Corbett. A lot of people thought, you know, Wolf obviously the projected leader, but people thought it would be closer than, uh, than the projections. Was it as you expected? Well, I'll tell you what. You know, I've been following this stuff since I've been 10 years old, and I have never seen a flawless candidacy that Tom Wolf ran. You know, we're talking about the weather. In the wintertime, when people were stuck in their house, he ran a huge million-dollar ad campaign. People got to know him. Then yesterday, I'm thinking, okay, you know, things can't go all that right for this guy. And then I'm driving home, and it's like 65 degrees, and I'm thinking, my God, the weather's even on his side. <laughs> he ran a very good campaign. He, uh, he hit every demographic in the exit polls. Uh, people had said that, um, you know, it was going to be closer than normal, but, you know, he had every single demographic, every age uh, group voted for him. Uh, he had a very, very well good campaign. The only thing that people actually said that he didn't do was maybe talk to the media as much as he should have. But he billed himself as an unconventional candidate. I think Governor Corbett had two things going against him, the education issue and also the voter ID issue that a lot of people really um, didn't talk about in the forefront of the campaign. But that really resonated in the huge population areas of the state in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And just to give you an example, here Here's a figure from one of the wards in Philadelphia, okay? The Democratic candidate, who was Wolf, got 5,000 votes in one of those wards. Corbett got 132 votes. Those people overwhelmingly voted for the Democratic candidate because of the voter ID um, uh, change that, uh, that uh, the governor uh, proposed and also the state house and state senate went around with him. So is it a surprise that it was larger than normal? No. I always, I always said that this campaign was like a Marx Brothers movie. And you know how when you watch a Marx Brothers movie, you know, uh, Chico was going to play the piano and Harpo was going to play the harp and stuff like that. You knew the conclusion of it. You kind of knew the the end of it, but you were hoping that there was going to be a turn somewhere around the way, and it hasn't been that way. And he won the election, and he won an historic election because this is the first time in Pennsylvania history that an incumbent governor was sent away, mm -hmm. and also the first time that the cycle, which we will talk about later, was broken with you know the eight-year administration of you know changing from one party to another. So it's been an incredible run for this guy, and now the big job is how he's going to be governing. Sure. Sure, and we're going to talk more about that coming up within the next two hours. Thank you so much for your insight. We appreciate it, Dave. Happy to be here. <laughs> and for more on our electric election coverage this morning, we turn to political expert and the author of the LULAC Political Letter, by the way, recently named Best Political Blog by Northeast Blog. So congratulations, David Yonkai here, helping us out with some uh, analyzing some of these races. Welcome. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Dave, well, for, first we'll talk about the uh, the national landscape, but we'll give it a, a local twist. Uh, last night, Governor or Governor Galect, excuse me, Tom Wolf uh, defeated Tom Corbett. He was one of the only Democrat governors to win last night. That's incredible because if you take a look at Wisconsin, Scott Walker was supposed to be in trouble. If you take a look at Florida, Charlie Crist and uh, Rick Scott, they had that big dust up mm -hmm. over Charlie uh, Crist's fan <laughs> during that debate. You know That was supposed to be um, um, a Democratic pickup. So yeah, I think that this is going to further and I mean, you know, I, I don't really want to sound over dramatic here, but this is going to um, solidify the legend, if you will, of Tom Wolf, that he's the only Democrat in um, the, the nation that actually, you know, came out ahead. And the interesting thing is he didn't run away from President Obama. Mm -hmm. While everybody else was heading for the hills and, you know, denying, uh, you know, that they even knew the guy, Tom Wolf had this rally on uh, Sunday in Philadelphia and he, and he enthusiastically welcomed him so it was in, it, it was a kind of interesting but we've seen all the ads out there um, across the country too that um, the Re Republicans kind of the GOP kind of seeming to say that you know if you're a Democrat you're voting with Obama so you elect a Democrat you're basically re-electing the president um, do you think that that kind of that tactic worked it worked but you know I think the Democrats should not have run that far away from President Obama they had a couple of things 
things that this president did in his time in office in the six years. We had great credit card reform. For the first time, you had um, a stock market that was back to booming. The deficit, you know, a couple of years ago, the Republicans were screaming, oh, the deficit, what about our grandchildren? We're going to have to pay. The deficit has gone down. That was consistently since this president came in. It's the lowest it's ever been since like 2008. So I think they ran away from those issues and I think they tried to localize the race and sometimes when somebody yells louder than you and you're trying to say local, local, local and they're trying to say president bad, the, the louder voices always, um, always prevail. So I think that they should not have run away that far away. And I think that in a, in a, in a strange sort of way, although there were different dynamics in the Wolf-Corbett race, by embracing, not embracing Obama, but welcoming him at least, um, I think that Wolf kind of set himself apart. And I'm just wondering if there were one or two candidates out there who basically said, okay, I disagree with the president on this, but this is what we did right. I think maybe there could have been a different outcome. But you know what? You said that there's going to be a meeting on Friday at the White House with the Republican leaders. Would you not want to be the fly <laughs> on the wall? Would you not want to hear what they have to say? I think that's going to be, I think it's going to be, we're, getting, we're in for a ride. Yeah. <laughs> so. Steve, thank you so much. <laughs> and for more on our election coverage, we turn to political expert and editor of the LULAC political letter blog, David Yonkai. So good morning. Happy to be here. Thanks for having a me. Late night and now an early morning. So we yes. uh, appreciate you making that turnaround. Not a problem. Talking about the governor's race, governor's race, it is historic in that Tom Wolf, uh, now our governor-elect, this is the first time in a very long time that a governor has not uh, been elected to a second term as in Tom Wolf. Right. Tom uh, in 1968, the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention gave governors the power to run uh, for a second term. And um, since 1974, the governors have been re-elected in the state of Pennsylvania. So this is a historic thing. Also, uh, since 1954, you've had eight years of Democratic rule, eight years of Republican rule, eight years Democrat. It's been like an eight-year cycle. Mm -hmm. This historic eight-year cycle has been broken by Tom Wolf. So this is a big thing because Pennsylvania always seemed to have, always seem seem to have had this uh, eight-year uh, deal where you know um, they were very polite about it. They mm -hmm. would you know exchange uh, you know pleasantries, and then the next thing you know you'd have eight years Democrat, eight years Republican. So that was a big. Thing. Uh, talking about Tom Wolf now, just some of the some of the change he plans to bring. He kind of won the election without really getting into too much detail what his plans are for the future. Well, he said he was an unconventional candidate, and that meant that he wasn't going to really you know say much about what he wanted to do. He would say at, at the debate uh, stage that. You know, I have no idea what I'm going to find when I get there. But I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a very, um, a very uh, business-like approach to okay, what do we have? What could we do? I think he's going to focus on education. His big thing with education was that you can't keep on throwing money at education until you know what type of jobs are out there. And I think what he wants to try to do is match educational skills for the jobs that are out there. Because Governor Corbett has said that you know there are jobs out there in the state of Pennsylvania but nobody wants them. Well, you have to be trained educationally for those people to get those jobs. So I think that's what he's going to do. Another thing that I think he's going to do in terms, of, um, in terms of a new administration is put a tax on the gas drilling and see exactly how that's going to work. The interesting thing is, how is Tom Wolf, a Democrat who came from nowhere, going to work with a heavily Republican legislature because that hasn't changed. And he seems to think that he's going to do it. You know, I mean, I've met the uh, person, I've met Tom Wolf a couple of times, and he just has this aura about him that, hey, we're going to do this. So I think uh, hopefully that will translate. And I think you're going to see uh, a different, uh, if you saw an a, a, a unconventional campaign, I think you're going to see an unconventional administration. So I think you're going to see some surprises from this guy. All right. We'll wait and see. David Yonkai, thank you so much for okay. your insight. We appreciate it. Uh, for more on our election coverage this morning, we turn to David Yonkai, who's very gracious to join us this morning after a late night last night. David, thank you Happy so much. Happy to be here. That's right. So yeah. we're going to talk about some of these local races. Um, a lot of them were kind of expected. Right. Uh, but there were some contentious ones there. There were some uh, ads, I think, that caught people's attention. I want to talk about uh, the Cipriani Coffer race. Uh, it was the seat that was vacated by Phyllis Money, so we were kind of interested to see um, who would get in there, Coffer, Aaron Coffer, winning that seat. Uh, what are your 
thoughts on kind of how that race played out? Well, you have to kind of put this race into perspective because a lot of people felt that Cipriani was going to win because she was the anointed successor to Phyllis Mundy. But this district was always a Republican district before Phyllis Mundy won it in 1990. What had happened was the Republican incumbent at that time was under indictment and Phyllis Mundy got that seat and and you know she did great constituent service and for like 20 years you know she was like the representative but the state Republican Party always felt that they could get this district back because originally it was a Kingston 44th Center district. Every person who held that office before Phyllis Mundy was either a Kingston or a 44th resident. So anybody who was going to challenge Phyllis Mundy tried to, you know, uh, come after her in Kingston and 44th, but because the Democratic registration was about even, you know, Phyllis Mundy always prevailed. With the challenger, I think Aaron Coffer had the opportunity to go and have both of uh, those districts, Kingston and 44th, in his corner solidly. He had a big grassroots campaign, but more importantly, what happened is the state Republican committee put a lot of money into this race and they targeted this race. So there's a lot of people who are calling this an upset. I don't see it as an upset because I think that Coffer, number one, ran. Uh, two years ago in, against Monday. He's an engaging person. He's young. When he gives a speech, it's funny. When he gives a speech, he'll walk around. And I mean, you know, he's very dynamic and engaging. And I think that uh, it's, and, and to me, it's not a surprise. I thought that Cipriani would win, but um, close. But uh, I'm not surprised that um, Coffer won, mainly because he had the backing. And also, I think that the people in the district want it this back and the state Republican Party wanted this district back too. Uh, if we could just quickly touch on maybe the big surprise is the amount of backing he received yes. financially especially. Yeah, I understand it was close to about $180,000 from the state Republican. And that's committee. very unusual for yeah. a, a local race like this. When, when, when a state Republican committee puts that much money into a local race against a district that has been long held Democratic, that's significant. And you have to give them trial for you know going after that money mm -hmm. and also you know having people uh, you know support him locally all right congratulations to mr. Coffer yeah. congratulations indeed all right David Yonkai thank you so much for your insight we appreciate it. you're gonna stick around for a little bit more and we'll talk more election results coming up Good morning, Eyewitness News continues on this Wednesday, November 5th. And we are back with more of our election coverage this morning. We've been getting a lot of great insight from political uh, expert David Yonkai. He's got a recap of some of the big races. Governor-elect Tom uh, Wolf, he was elected last night. A pretty pretty good margin he was elected. Ten-point margin. I kind of feel pretty good about it because yeah. uh, yesterday with Jasmine, I said it would be between five and ten points. So I'm, I'm, there you go. First time of prediction. Doing this there eight you. years, I'm right <laughs> into prediction. You know? There you go. Uh, but uh, a lot of... Of, uh, the Re Republicans. It was a big night for Republicans. Yes. Uh, turning point uh, in, on the national level. What do you think going forward uh, the next few years? What do you think that's going to mean? They have to be. They have got to step back from this nonsense. And um, I think the uh, Republicans have to start taking small bites. They have to do an incremental thing. If they go and rush right in there and try to repeal a lot of the stuff that the president did, they're going to get in trouble. Now, he's already dug in because he's going to do an executive order on immigration. So we're going to have to see what that reaction is going to be. But I think that uh, they should all take a step back. He has to realize that he has to work with them. He has to compromise with them, and they have to compromise with him. This, the whole thing has been a grid, uh, gridlock right from the start. When he first got elected, Mitch McConnell said that we're going to make him a one-term president. They didn't. They have to start compromising, and they have to step back and figure something out, because if not, uh, we're going to have two years of insanity. And uh, somebody off camera mentioned impeachment. If the Republicans start talking impeachment on stuff that is like totally 
uh, irrelevant, then we're just going to be back to two years of just going back and forth in this tug of war that nobody wants. The reason why since 2006 you've had changeover in Congresses is because people aren't satisfied and you have to come to some kind of consensus and you have to come to some type of agreement. I'm talking about people not being satisfied, the president with uh, some of the lowest approval ratings, which is, uh, which is something that's seen often in the, in the sixth year of a, of a presidency. But just looking ahead to 2016, Hillary Clinton is a name that's on a lot of people's lips. Is she someone that can maybe breathe some life back into the Democrats? I think so. The problem with the, the with Mrs. Clinton is with Senator Clinton, Secretary Clinton, whatever name you want to give her, and everything. Um, it, it, it just seems like um, it, it's almost like a fait accompli. And I just have a, a, a weird feeling that there's going to be some challenger in the Democratic Party that may make her better. But you know what? Um, you ha you've had eight years of a Democratic administration. Uh, the Republicans right now have a real strong wind at their back if they pick the right candidate. I don't have a lot of faith that the Republicans will pick the right candidate for president because they've been wrong on a lot of issues in terms of you know a growing, changing demographic. So I think yeah, there's a good chance that, uh, Hillary Clinton will become president. But again, we, we can never tell because, you know, politics, you could never predict from like one minute to another because things... Let alone two years change. in the future. Exactly. <laughs> We're talking two years, but, you know, you bring up a good point about, um, you know, Secretary Clinton, but uh, it's too early to tell right now because look at who would have thought a year ago that Tom Wolf would be the governor. Right. You really can't. And here it is. Yeah, exactly. Right. And here it is. Thank definitely. Thank you so much for your commentary. My we pleasure. We really appreciate it this morning. And we're going to get a check of the weather when we come back.